atom of my being. And I hope that you believe in miracles, too. You know, you miss so much when you don't believe in miracles. And it's the easiest thing in the whole world to be leave God to perform a miracle for you when you trust him with all of your heart. Well, Jimmy's here today. <laughs> Jimmy McDonald. And Jimmy, tell me, what are you going to sing for us today? One of the great old hymns of the church, a hymn that has blessed many hearts. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and his righteousness. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. All other ground is sinking sand. His oath is covenant, his blood supports me in the whelming flood. When all around my soul gives way, he that is all my hope, my stay. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. All other ground is sinking sand. When he shall come with trumpet sound, In his righteousness alone, faultless to stand before the throne. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. All other to climb, and for every stone that bruised my feet, and for all the blood and the sweat and the grime, for blinding storms and burning heat. My heart sings but a grateful song, for these were the things that made me strong. For all the heartaches and the tears, for all the anguish and the pain, for gloomy days and fruitless years, and for the hopes that I'd lived in vain, I do give thanks. For now I know that these were the things that helped me grow. Tis not of the softer things of life which stimulate man's will to strive, but bleak adversity and strife do most to keep man's will alive. 
or rose broom pies, the weaklings creep. But brave hearts dare to climb the steep. It was the other Saturday. I was weary in body. It had been one of the hardest weeks that I had spent in my life. I'd worked so hard. And during the week, I had received calls from not only churches here in the United States, but there was the letter from Tokyo. Would I come and minister in Tokyo? And in just one week, there had been at least six calls from England. And then came the letter from Sweden and the doctor who contacted me from Norway. Would I come and preach in Norway? And then the businessman who asked, would I please come to Berlin and preach? I stood in the kitchen of my home I was alone in the house and I looked up and I said, Heavenly Father, why did you wait so long? Why couldn't you let all of this happen when I was young, 16, 17 years of age, 18? I was never tired then, never. I had accepted Christ when I was 14 years of age at Little Methodist Church in Concordia, Missouri. Those early years, the first years of my ministry in Idaho, in those little country churches, there was Emmett, there was Filer, there was Caldwell, Idaho. I didn't need any sleep those years. I was never weary. I could close a service in a little Methodist church, ride the bus all night, never close my eyes and sleep. I wasn't tired. It was all so challenging and so wonderful. And I had so much vitality. And the other Saturday night when I looked up and said, and I meant it, I meant it with all of my heart when I said, why did you wait so long, Heavenly Father? Now, my years are limited. And there's so much to be done. And there are times I get weary in body. Do you want to know something? There wasn't an audible voice spoken. He didn't speak to me audibly. But it was just as real as though he had spoken audibly to me. And I felt his wonderful presence. And this is what I knew that he said. Had I allowed all of this to happen when you were 16, 17, 18 years of age, you would have blown it. You would have blown it. I was so inexperienced. Of course, I felt I knew everything. Don't we all at that age? I felt I knew all the answers. Ask me anything. I was dead sure I knew theology. And in those early years, had enough confidence to write just a little, I think it was 18 or 20 page booklet. All of my theology was in it. <laughs> and now I'd like to call in all of those little booklets because I was so wrong in some of the things in my ideas. I remember the time when I did the washing at home at our house, every Monday was wash day. 
Rain, shine, snow. It made no difference what the weather was like. Mama always washed. Always. And I had what to wash. We had the laundry stove in the basement, and then she'd put the boiler on top of the laundry stove. She boiled her sheets, I knew that. And the pillowcases, I knew that. And I just took for granted that Mama boiled everything when she did the washing. And on this particular Monday, just as she had the water in the boiler on the laundry stove, ready to begin her washing, the telephone rang and they asked Mama to come over to Aunt Sophie's house. And Sophie had become seriously ill. And she left me at home alone and she said, Now, Catherine, don't touch anything. I'll be back just as quickly as I possibly can. Perhaps it'll only be a couple of hours. But don't get into any trouble. Oh, of course, Mama, of course I won't. How old I was, I'm not quite sure. <laughs> I'm not quite sure. But I had all the self-confidence in the world, and when Mama was gone, I said, I'm going to do the washing. I'll surprise her. And down those basement steps I went. I boiled everything, regardless of color, regardless of what it was. It all went in the boiler. Everything. Everything. Everything that Mama had in the clothes basket. I boiled it. I was so thrilled to think that when Mama would come home, she'd be so surprised, she'd be so thrilled. I knew she'd come home tired and I had the washing done. And she didn't get home until very late that night, around 10 o'clock. I waited up for her. I had hung all the clothes on the clothesline. And then when they were dry, you see, I noticed that there were streaks on some of the white clothes. I noticed that something had happened, but I wasn't quite sure. And then when they were all dry, I put them back into the clothes basket, brought them all in the house, Waited for Mama to come. I knew she'd be so thrilled. I knew she'd be so thrilled. The washing was done and when she came in. And took one look at the ruined clothes. I'll never, I'll never so long as I live forget the look on her face. And it wasn't until a long time later that I found out I had ruined a beautiful little cashmere white coat and bonnet. I had boiled. I had ruined some of her best clothes. Child of mine, You couldn't have taken it then. You knew so little. You were so inexperienced, and it was true. I had no knowledge in those early years of what Paul was talking about when he talked about the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. I knew nothing about the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, and one cannot give to anyone else any more than one has experienced himself. And remember, Paul did not talk about that matchless, wonderful grace of the Lord Jesus Christ until he too had been through some things. All that I knew was that I'd been born again in that little Methodist church that Sunday morning. Jesus had come into my heart, had forgiven my sins. 
I knew my sins were forgiven, but I knew nothing about the Gethsemane. I had never had a garden of Gethsemane. I knew nothing about the night when the stars had ceased to shine. I knew nothing about the deep waters. I knew nothing about what it meant to stand before an open grave. But I learned. I learned about those deep waters. I learned what it meant to stand Stand before an open casket and know that your papa was no longer there. And you wouldn't see him again until you saw him in the presence of Jesus. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the matchless grace. The years have passed, and with those passing years, great experiences. And all that I know about the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ is what I have experienced. And all that I know about the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ is what I have seen men and women experience. When Speedy would come and say, I've tried everything else. I want to be delivered from alcohol. I must have deliverance. When the man came, only a few weeks ago, and he said I've been an alcoholic for over 30 years of my life, and there is no hope for me. I've tried everything. I've tried everything there is, and now I come, and I come to the Lord Jesus Christ. And the simple prayer that was prayed, it was so simple. There was really no theology involved, not really. You see, it's all so simple, that's the reason most folk miss it. And at the close of that simple prayer, I shall never forget, as he turned and pointed a finger, to summon the audience and said, Honey, I'll never steal from you again. I'll never steal from you again. And he was addressing his wife. She didn't dare leave anything worthwhile in sight. He would steal it, sell it for money. For liquor. And in that moment, the blood of Jesus Christ, God's Son, did cleanse him from all sin. And he became a new creature in Christ Jesus. I knew, he knew, what the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ was all about. Or well, the young teenager. A beautiful young girl, not more than 17, 18 years of age, during one of the miracle services, came walking up to me and looked me directly in the face and said, Catherine Coleman, is there hope for me? I've had two abortions. And I'm still so young. Do you think Jesus will forgive my sins? And without hesitation, I said, of course he'll forgive your sins. Of course he'll forgive your sins. It wasn't a matter of giving her theology. It wasn't a matter of preaching doctrine. It was a matter of the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. 
Or as the man who came into the dressing room at the close of a service and said, It isn't the healing for my body for which I've come. I want just one question answered, just one. Will God forgive the sins of a man who's been instrumental in the death of literally thousands and thousands and thousands of innocent people? I would not dare betray confidence and tell you who that man And he looked to me directly in the face. And in that moment, I picked up this precious word of the word of God. And I said, sir, I have but one authority. And it's the highest authority in heaven and earth. It's the very word of God. And God's word says, if we confess our sins, he is able and just to forgive us our sins. And I give you his word. If you confess your sins as simply as a child who at night prays that prayer, now I lay me down to sleep. I pray the Lord of my soul to keep. And I heard one of the greatest scientists pray that simple prayer. One month later, he came back and he said, I've traveled 10,000 miles to come back to tell you it works. It works. And the love of God, and who can fathom the love of God? The one who said, I have loved thee with an everlasting love. I didn't know the full extent and the full depth of that love in those early days in Idaho. I know now. And the fellowship and the communion of the Holy Ghost. I knew nothing of that wonderful fellowship, that wonderful communion, that glorious oneness, that strengthening power of the Holy Spirit. I know now. I still can't wash very well. I still don't know much about washing. I still ruin a few things once in a while. But after I would have preached my last sermon, and I leave this whole earth, and I close my Bible for the last time, and I stand in his presence, I'll say, Wonderful Jesus, I try.